Green Mountain Powers College Connection is sponsored by College of St. Joseph and Stafford Technical Center. At the College of St. Joseph, what we would like to do is look beyond just getting them into the program, but making them the best in those programs and successful. Part of the concern at a place like CSA is, oh, it's small, but instead of looking at it as a problem, we can look at it as it's actually great. We're flexible. We can make changes in our programs very quickly. We don't have to wait years to do that. I like the small size of the classrooms and uh, the small amount of students. Everyone gets individualized attention from the instructor. It's very comfortable and very, just very nice to be in. At Stafford Technical Center, you can explore your possibilities, have hands-on learning, pursue your passion, and start your career. Want to see what they're laughing at? Visit StaffordOnline.org, and while you're there, you might as well check out our application page. for coming out. Uh, this is really kind of exciting for me, actually. I don't often get to do this. Um, I am a cultural and historical geographer. Um, just out of curiosity, in this room, does anybody know what that actually is? Because most people don't. So if you don't, don't worry about it. I'll explain that in a second. Um, but what I'm here for is to talk about, well, the, the title is Culture, Sustainability, and the Importance of Renewable Energy Resources. One thing you're going to find in this talk is that renewable energy resources won't be seen that much because I'm really going to be talking about culture sustainability and the need to adapt to the environment, which is eventually where uh, renewable energy resources come in. So uh, this really is a question of adaptation for me. Um, but before I get into it, I usually anticipate this. Uh, as a practicing cultural geographer, I know that not a lot of people know really what academic geographers do. So just out of curiosity, if you hear the term geography, what do you tend to think of? Globe. I'm sorry? A globe. A globe. It's actually pretty much what I thought when I first took my my first geography course many, many, many years ago. What else? Finding places on the map. Finding places on the map. Okay, that's also what geography is, absolutely. What else? Terrain, rainforest versus tundra. Okay, terrain, uh, rainforest versus tundra. So we're getting into biomes and climates and things like that too. Anything else? Physical. Different communities or different uh, countries. Okay. Boundaries. Okay, different countries, boundaries. Absolutely. So, all of those things are definitely what geography is. But geography is also a lot more. Um, it's really tough to describe because geographers have desperately been trying to explain this to the general public and to their bosses at colleges and universities since at least the 1950s, pretty much unsuccessfully. But basically, <coughs> excuse me, geographers like me, we think of the Earth as our home. And that's what we study. We study the Earth as home to humans. Um, we study the questions of where is it? Why is it there? How does that thing, wherever it is, relate to other things? And why is that significant? So really, that's what geography is to me. Um, I think 
the old University of Chicago definition for geography was the study of the why of where, which does kind of sum up a lot of what geography is. Uh, and geographers study five themes. We study location, so where things are. We study place, the physical and cultural characteristics at that location. So what is it that makes Rutland Rutland as opposed to Castleton or Ira or Burlington? Um, we tend to simplify lots of places that have a lot of similarities if they're near each other into regions. So we will look at regions and then we'll look at the connections among places or locations or regions in the form of movement whether it's the movement of weather systems or the movement of people or the movement of ideas. And then, of course, we look at human environment interactions, how we relate to the environment, how the environment influences us, how we make choices within the parameters that the uh, environment imposes, and how we, in turn, affect the environment. Which means we study basically everything, right? <laughs> pretty much everything that has to do with people on Earth. Um, I will admit that because we tend to study all these different things, it's very difficult to become an expert in any one area, which is why we need historians and geologists and political scientists. So it's good to know that people like that are actually needed. <laughs> there are a lot more political scientists or historians or geologists than geographers in the world, and unfortunately for me. <coughs> Excuse me. But I am what you would call a human geographer. I know it means I'm human, right? But really what that means is I study people. I could have been a physical geographer. I could have studied climate. I could have studied topography. I could have studied any of those things. But I chose to study people specifically and cultures in particular. And in my case, I consider myself a cultural geographer, which makes me kind of related to anthropologists, as well as a historical geographer, which makes me related to historians. But as you'll see during this talk, I'm also going to bring things in from like climatology, so from physical geography, so from other areas. And that's really what geography is. It's a discipline that tries to bring other disciplines together to understand the Earth and our, our place on the Earth. So we're definitely not going to be taking any jobs away from anyone in those other disciplines, but we're here to help. So what I want to talk about is really very vaguely the idea of natural resources. In fact, I really won't get to natural resources till the end. But I want to concentrate on human environment interactions and particularly the need to adapt to different environments. Because we're at the point where a lot of people, especially in the United States, really don't give the environment a second thought sometimes. If it's too hot, you turn up the heat. If it's too cold, you turn up the air conditioning. Um, I think in Vermont, we might have a slightly different perspective because we do get those really cold winters with a lot of snow that will affect whether we can go to this place or that place. Um, but with technology, we're in increasingly insulated from from this idea that we are actually related to the environment. The environment and us, we relate to each other. So really this talk is kind of a, almost a reminder of some of the ways that we have been connected to the environment in the past and some of the ways that we maybe continue to be. And by the way, if anybody has any questions or comments as I'm going through this, please feel free to you know, raise your hand or say something, I'll repeat it so that, you know, because I have the microphone here, so it'll be repeated that way. But basically, I want to start with this idea of culture. We all have culture. Some of it might not be high culture. I know that's my case, you know, definitely true with me. But um, every culture in the world reflects somehow interaction with the environment. In fact, the way geographers see this idea of culture is that culture is really adaptation to the environment, series of adaptations to the environment. The way we speak, our language reflects environment. I mean, how many words do we have in the English language for water running through a ditch? 
which says something about the origins of the English language in England, which is a pretty wet climate. Um, and you can look at political systems the same way or, um, oh, I don't know, religious systems, all these different cultural systems that affect the way and actually are created so that we can live in particular environments in particular situations. So cultural systems are basically our adaptations to the environment. Now, if these cultural systems are sustainable over a long period of time, meaning they don't, um, you know, they don't, what's it called? That's all right. Um, you know, if they're sustainable, meaning that they don't, um, really have a negative impact on the environment over a long period of time so that the resource base isn't really strongly affected. Um, then culture can be, you know, successful cultures are sustainable if they can adapt, is what I'm trying to say. So if we adapt to the environment in a way that is sustainable, then that culture theoretically could continue to go on and on and on within that environment, assuming the environment doesn't change. And sometimes you will find traits within a culture that don't necessarily uh, seem to do anything. They're sort of like what we used to think about the appendix in the human body. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of there. It doesn't really do anything. But actually, it turns out that there is a good reason for it being there. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what the good reason is for the appendix to be there, but I'm assured that they're starting to discover that now. <laughs> but, um, I, you'll probably get to this, but lots of cultures adapt their environments to themselves. Absolutely, yeah. Right, so you can flip one and two on their head, right? Yeah, yeah, but uh, if they adapt their environments to themselves, it has to be done in a way that's sustainable if they're going to continue to live in that environment. So it has to be an upward spiral. So there are those traits that are going to serve no obvious purpose. They might be sustainable, though, so they really don't do any harm. And I'm going to show you a couple of, of cases where that's true. Whereas unsuccessful uh, cultures, excuse me, typically aren't sustainable. Uh, in fact, we will often call them maladapted to their environment. Maladapted, bad adaptation. Uh, when a culture is maladapted, usually there is a spiral downward that will eventually cause the crash of that culture. The culture will disappear. We've seen that over and over in human history. <coughs> I'm only going to talk about one of them because I don't have time to talk about all of them. There are some really good books out there on that, though. But before I get too far into that, this is a map, it's an internet map, so I didn't do this, but it's an internet map of climate zones of the continental United States. And what I want to draw your attention to with this map is this area here, this green section on the map, um, which is a humid subtropical climate. It's a southern climate. Hot during the summer, humid, wonderful place as long as you have air conditioning. <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, I also want to draw your attention to this area here, sort of this olive green area, uh, which is the Great Plains. And unlike the, you know, the southern climate, Great Plains is very dry. In fact, if you're in Texas, this part of Texas, they like to brag about their dry heat. So if it's 100 degrees, yeah, it's only 100 degrees because it's a dry heat. Which actually, you know, does feel a little bit better than, say, 95 in the wet heat, but they're still, it's still hot. <laughs> Trust me on that. I lived in Texas for three years. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the other thing about this map is that you know, these lines between climate zones, obviously they're not strict lines. So you're not going to be walking around in the, the middle of the southern forest and then all of a sudden you're going to be on the Great Plains. You know, there tend to be transition zones that aren't reflected on this map. And those transition zones, which are sometimes called ecotones, um, those, are, those will be transitions between the really wet climates and the really dry climates. Of course, in the case of Texas, it's a very rapid transition. 
So with that in mind, and I will bring this map back up a couple of times. With that in mind, I want to give you an example of the Texas Panhandle and the Upland South, just as far as a culture that has adapted to its environment, or at least did at one time. Okay, this map, which comes from a book called The Upland South by Terry Jordan Bishkov, who I'm going to um, refer to a bunch of times, actually shows the development of a southern culture in Tennessee. It's called Middle Tennessee on this map. What happened is you had three not totally distinct populations on the coast, but three really culture hearts. One of them, the Carolina Low Country, was a place where people who had had experiences in the Caribbean settled. And they brought with them some of those experiences when they settled there. Um, that includes both uh, whites with ancestry in Europe and African Americans. I'm sorry, Africans who would become African Americans. Uh, Chesapeake Tidewater, those are more directly English whites along with Africans. Uh, who, whose descendants would become African Americans. And then this area, the lower Delaware River Valley, had a little bit more of a diverse population that settled there. So you had a little bit of Swedish, a little bit of German even, Scottish, um, as well as English and a couple of other groups. And then of course, into all of this, you also have various Native American groups. You know, a bunch of different cultures actually in the zone. And what happened is, as these different people brought their cultural traits into what would become the United States in the 1600s and 1700s, they began to move, and then into the 1800s, into the mountains, they um, assembled, reassembled in different configurations, and eventually gave us a very upland southern culture that we would recognize as being maybe centered on Nashville. A particular way of speaking, y'all, all y'all, all y'alls all of which mean different things, by the way. <laughs> um, maybe some of the foods are a little bit different there, the music that developed there. It's all a result of this cultural mixing, but this cultural mixing within this environment. And ultimately, you know, as this map just generally shows, these groups that started on the coast and then eventually ended up in Tennessee and elsewhere, they pushed westward. And so they brought those traits with them up to a point. And the first thing I want to start with as far as cultural traits is death, <laughs> mainly because it's one of my interests. In Texas, th this is from a Texas burial ground um, in the Texas Panhandle. So it's the area just south of the Oklahoma Panhandle. So it's the top of Texas, let's say. And if you want to imagine a Texas cemetery, you would have, you know, at first glance, it might look kind of like a cemetery you find here, but, you know, and it would have maybe a fence around it. Usually it has what's called a lich gate, which is a passage between the land of the living and the land of the dead. Um, you know, a, a lot of things that, you know, really don't matter in terms of adapta excuse me, adaptation. But this is one element that I find really kind of interesting in some Texas cemeteries. Scraped earth. You find it here, in this picture here and here. These aren't recent burials. Every year, the people go into the graveyards and they take all the weeds off of their loved one's graves. The idea being that it's disrespectful to allow grass or weeds to grow on top of your dead loved ones. Sounds kind of odd, right? Well, there are a couple of different theories about where that came from. The one that I like best actually is Terry Jordan Bishkov's theory. And that's that this idea of scraped earth may actually have originated somewhere in Africa. And when people were transported to North America as slaves. They brought this cultural trait with them. And the idea in Africa apparently was that you try to take all the weeds and grass out of your village so that you can see the path that snakes take, which could be very important. You know, it's, it's an adaptation in Africa, at least parts of Africa. 
here, it doesn't really make as much sense, but what may have happened is that um, slaves may have seen the, this idea of clearing grass to, so that you can see the snakes and looked at Christianity with serpents and, you know, death obviously comes into it. And now <coughs> you have a reason to have scraped earth. Nobody remembers why it's done anymore, but that's one plausible theory as to how that uh, came into being in Texas. So now, this is an African American <coughs> cemetery? This actually is a mixed cemetery. This does happen to be a, an African American grave site. But you would find this on white, in fact, next slide, find this on uh, white grave sites as well. And it, it's a trait that actually went from African culture to um, white American culture as well as African American culture. In this case, this, this does not make sense to me. Not only do they clear the grave site, but they also mound up dirt on top of the grave sites. There's absolutely no reason to do that. They continue to do that. I, I've seen cemeteries from the 1930s where, you know, grave sites from the 1930s, they continue to clear the site of weeds and then pile up the dirt on top of the, um, on top of the grave site. I don't know why it's done, but apparently it doesn't really harm anything. So, you know, it's one of those traits that, well, it's just done. However, there is one trait. I, I visited literally every cemetery in northern Texas. It took about a year to do this. Um, one thing I never saw is a structure like this. this a, a student sent this to me knowing that I really liked um, cemeteries. So that I, have the, I have a bunch of students from Texas who still keep in touch with me. This is what's known as grave shed. Now, grave sheds can be as simple as this. They can even actually be even more simple. Four posts with a roof on top. They can look like houses. They can have uh, fences around where the roof section is. <coughs> they can actually be quite elaborate. And one of the theories about those is they may have actually been adapted from Native American culture um, among people in Tennessee and spread westward from Tennessee into Texas and, and elsewhere in the Upland South. But <coughs> this is where grave sheds have been observed. This God, is, was there a shed above what we saw? Or was that just a roof? No, it was just a roof. Okay. It was just to protect the grave site. These are the locations that Terry Jordan Bishkov found grave sheds. And this is my study area. Now, why do you suppose I couldn't find any grave sheds in that part of Texas? Hard to dig. What was that? Hard to dig. It is hard to dig, but that's probably not it. Actually, I think it's something even more basic than that. If you look at where these dots are located and then compare that with climate zones in the United States, those dots are completely, almost completely located within this green section within that humid subtropical climate where you have the wet conditions that allow for trees to grow. You don't really have tree growth over here. So my feeling, and I haven't published on this, but neither has anyone else, but my feeling based on my observations is that as these cultures moved westward through Texas and they came into this ecotone area and they had to adapt to this new environment, they dropped the grave shed because it didn't make any sense to build grave sheds in cemeteries. Where, where there's no wood. And maybe something a little more everyday than that would be house styles. This is what's known as a dog trot log cabin. This is actually on the campus of the West Texas A&M University in Canyon, Texas, which is near Amarillo. So everything around the campus is probably yellow, with no trees. But campus, because they have lots of water in Texas, which they don't, um, they, they, they do tend to overwater a lot more. <coughs> At least they did when these pictures were taken. Now, the dog trot log cabin is something that appears to have originated in Europe, probably Sweden. 
came into the United States through the Delaware Valley, got into the mountains, and then just kind of spread throughout the mountains pretty much everywhere in the south. In fact, it even expanded beyond the south. And the reason probably is that it's really well adapted to the climate of the south. You've got two rooms with sleeping quarters upstairs and a breezeway passage between those two rooms. Now, if you think about the shape of this log cabin, first of all, what it's made of, logs. Obviously, you need trees to build a log cabin, so it's well adapted to life in the mountains, for example. You have a pitched roof, which is good for snow removal in the winter, if there is any snow, and certainly for when it rains, rain's going to just come right off that roof. If you have to heat up one of these rooms during the summer, if you're using it as your kitchen, the other room remains a little bit cooler. And of course, the breezeway passage makes for a really nice place to kind of relax in the shade during the course of the day, as long as you're not getting direct sunlight on that location of the house. So again, this, even though it wasn't created in the, the Upland South, it was really well adapted to it and just kind of spread everywhere. This is Terry Jordan's diagram of where you find dog trots in the United States. The one that you saw is this one. It's the westernmost <coughs> existing example. Pattern isn't quite as clear, but if you're looking at the movement of people into Texas, what happens here where you switch climates? We go into an area with fewer trees, you're less likely to find log cabins like this. So again, it's an adaptation of the environment, not only that we have those log cabins, but the fact that we don't have those log cabins a little further west. Why isn't Florida on board with this? Uh, you know, I'm not sure because, I mean, this is mostly an upland southern trait, but as you can see, there are some in the lower south too. And you would think that because of settlement patterns that you'd find this at least into northern Florida. For some reason, you don't. And I'm wondering, based on the, the, the locations, if that has something to do with just how wet the ground is in these areas with a high water table, especially along the coast. In fact, if you, whoops, here. If you look at, th this actually is a southern Florida house. This is in Jupiter, Florida. Um, they call it a cracker farmhouse or a southern cracker farmhouse. They say it with pride, by the way. Um, that's a house that's adapted to the Florida environment. Look at these big windows. Now, this is a relatively tall person. She's, I think, almost six feet tall. So it gives you some idea of how big those windows are. Um, got a porch here which is another good place to sit in the hot sun. <coughs> so by having these big windows, you can keep the, the house cool. On the other hand, you don't see a chimney here, do you? The chimney is actually off the back where there's a, a kitchen uh, so that you don't heat up the main house. <coughs> You've got the pitched roof so that when it rains, the water comes right off the roof. And also, this house is on pylons because of that high water table. So those are ways that uh, the people who built that house originally adapted to the Florida environment. Any idea where the, that one might be? It's not in the south. <laughs> this is your main entrance, and these are very wide logs. It's a log cabin with wide eaves. This is in the Pacific Northwest. It's actually a little north of Seattle. So it's another example of adapting to your environment, in this case, a really rainy environment, where you do have a lot of very large trees, at least you did when this was built. So you know, clearly in the south, now the other parts of the United States, at one time, we were very much adapted to the environment in terms of our housing. And that's true in New England, too. <coughs> this is a New England Cape Cod. Uh, this particular one probably dates from about 1800, but they do predate that as well, uh, going back to the 1600s. 
What makes this adapted to New England is, first of all, this side of the house faces south. So it's catching the, the sun during the day. You've got the pitched roof so that when it snows, and it will snow, not that we've seen that recently, um, that snow is going to come off that roof. It has a center chimney. The kitchen is actually, the original kitchen was in the house, and that chimney fed both the, or not fed, but the, the kitchen used that chimney, but also a couple of rooms off of it, so that you could heat up the whole house with that one single chimney in the center of the house. A um, couple of other things, there was a, found, uh, not a foundation, a basement, actually, that was dug. Believe it or not, the basement is not something that you used to find in England. That's something that it looks like the Puritans started based on the idea of Native American root cellars. Now, this is according to a geographer named Martin Bowden. I don't think he's ever published on this, but he's been saying this for a while, so I tend to believe him because he was my advisor as an undergraduate. <laughs> um, but you know, he, he contends that basements, dugout basements, were found in New England before they were found in England, and it was something that just got transferred backward. Well, not backward, but back. Um, one other thing is that when they built their barn, they built it to the northwest of the house to block the uh, oncoming wind from the northwest, which would have been the coldest and probably most dominant wind. So that is a house that was very much connected to its environment. That's the bigger version in New England large. Um, again, southern exposure, basement, center chimney. Uh, eventually, in the 19th century, we started to connect our farm buildings to the main house. That was sort of a weird thing that came out of this idea of the ideal farm where that's kind of beyond the realm of adaptation. What we're finding now is that when barns catch on fire, they tend to take the houses with them in these cases, so they tend not to be rebuilt um, in the same way. But same idea, and also the small windows, I forgot that on the front, that's also part of energy savings for the winter. But what happened during the 19th century? We kind of got away from that idea. So we got into uh, situations where we started to feel like we controlled the, the environment around us a little bit more. Uh, this is on the campus of Castleton State College. I can't say for sure what was in that house before they redid it, um, but this is a house that it doesn't have a long side that faces south. Actually, the long side of this house faces east. Um, it has a porch, which is really not that practical, especially one with a relatively flat roof in Vermont. I mean, you kind of have to get up there and shovel it if, it's, if you get too much snow. One thing that may have allowed this to happen is changes in the heating of the house, especially the introduction of uh, central heat, or for that matter, just a coal furnace at one point. Even by the 1920s, this is also in Castleton, um, it's a Sears Craftsman house. It's actually bought from a Sears catalog back when they sold houses. Um, you know, they have a porch too. They have the wide eaves, which is fine, the steep roof pitch, which is also fine in this environment, but you could find this in Arizona if you wanted to as well. And it's really a house that was made for any environment. It's not perfect for this environment. You can tell that by the big windows. Um, but again, it's something that probably changes in the way that we heat our homes would have allowed. Of course, more recently, <coughs> there's definitely no central chimney in this. It's a ranch. Uh, they do have a chimney in the back. They do actually have a basement, apparently. But... It's not the most practical layout, not, not the most efficient layout for a house in New England. Something that may have allowed this to happen, though, is that we've also had um, advances in insulation during the course of the 20th century and in, into the 21st. So as we've insulated our houses differently, as we've added double and triple glazing windows, um, things like that, maybe we've been able to change our houses a little bit. 
although I, I suspect, I could be wrong, I suspect this is heated with electricity. I'm not positive, it would be about right, about the right time. As opposed to this, double wide, I mean, you can imagine that when it snows, you have to get up on the roof to shovel the snow off and all that. Uh, I suspect they have a wood stove. A lot of double wide seem to have wood stoves. But again, it's not really the ideal house type for Vermont, at least in terms of being adapted. <laughs> so, how does that relate to everything else? <laughs> How does that relate to uh, the environment? How does that relate to um, natural resources? Well, let's just take a look at what industrialization has done. Industrialization has been great and it's been terrible. It's also been good and kind of bad and kind of in the middle. Um, a textbook that I used to use in my cultural geography class used to call this, it doesn't anymore, but it used to call this a Faustian bargain, this idea of industry. Industry has done some wonderful things. I mean, human lifespan has increased considerably because of industrialization. We have more food than ever because of industrialization. We have better medical care in some ways uh, as a result of industrialization. Um, industrialization allows me to take my phone and look up pieces of information that if I were still at college or university uh, years and years ago uh, before we had electricity, we would have, you know, it might have taken me hours to get that same information. Of course, I'm not saying that Wikipedia is always right, but. Um, so there's some wonderful things that have come with industrialization, and really I wouldn't trade uh, some of those benefits for anything. But there have been some environmental costs too. So the Industrial Revolution began in Lancaster, England in 1750. Initially, it was based on water power, but eventually it started to rely on fossil fuels. Um, by the 1790s, it was in the United States, in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, with the Slater Mills. Um, and you can maybe think about industrialization as an adaptation to the environment, really a way to almost control the environment, control what's around us so that we can you know, without getting into some of these theories, um, to get into, um, you know, so, so we can live longer and happier. Don't tell that to the people who work in the early industries, but certainly by now. So there's no question that industrialization has been positive, but probably the biggest issue today, other than water pollution, um, fish population problems, uh, all kinds of wildlife issues, we have this global warming issue. And it is an undeniable fact that since the start of the Industrial Revolution, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased significantly. From, and it doesn't really take that much CO2 in the atmosphere to cause warming. <coughs> um, having some CO2 in the atmosphere is a good thing because it insulates the earth so that we don't release all of our heat during the nighttime and then freeze to death before morning. But what's been happening is we've gone from somewhere below 280 parts per million in 1750 all the way up to just last year it was measured at 400 parts per million in Hawaii. It's a very, very rapid increase and most of that increase actually has come since the end of World War II with the well, there are actually a few reasons. One of them is that industrialization has really spread throughout the world. So <coughs> we have increase in CO2. These are uh, the, the readings from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii <coughs> uh, showing this increase from below 320 parts per million to roughly 400 uh, last year. I think it was last year. And of course, with that comes an increase in the average sur surface temperature. <laughs> so those facts are indisputable, that we have warming of the planet, it is measured warming, and CO2 levels have been increasing. There's definitely a correlation there, at least. The alarming thing is how quickly this has happened. So if you go back 10,000 years, 
these are the CO2 levels. And like I said, the CO2 levels are, will probably match up to a temperature reading if we could have one. <coughs> so based on what we can find in trapped air in the ice core samples that we get out of Greenland <coughs> and elsewhere, we find that the level of CO2 remained kind of constant. It, it rose a little bit, but then just in the last 250 years or so has really increased a lot. Now, why is that important? This is where the adaptation comes in. I'm only going to give one example, but there was once a settlement that there was a TV show called Secrets of the Dead, which I think is still on, but one of their early episodes was The Lost Vikings of Greenland. It was a really cool episode, actually. Um, I prefer to call them Norse, but, you know, maybe Vikings is okay. But the Norse settled in a couple of different places in Greenland, and I want to concentrate on the Western settlement here. They settled in the Western settlement around 1000 AD. They disappeared by 1500. So within 500 years, which admittedly is still longer than European, well, the English at least, had been in North America, but within 500 years, they disappeared from Greenland. Nobody really knows what happened, but we do know some, some of these things. We know that when the Vikings or Norse got to Greenland in around 1000, they were actually pretty well adapted to the environment that they found that they, um, they were farmers and they were able to carry on a farming lifestyle just like they would have in Europe. But around 1300, 1350, you had a sudden cooling of Greenland's climate. And that reduced the summer growing season. And as a result, after 1350 or so, you started to see um, increased soil erosion from overgrazing. And with that increased soil erosion, of course, that meant less food overall. Less food overall meant less healthy people. And so you had a kind of a, a dying off over time of especially young women of childbearing age. And of course, when that happens, that's going to be pretty much the end of your civilization. Now, at the same time, they also had reduced trade with Europe. That was just merely coincidental. That had, as far as we know, nothing to do with the climate. But the Norse disappeared by 1500, but there was another group of people that didn't because they adapted, the Inuit. They were already adapted to a colder climate. They were able to absorb these changes in their culture. And as a result, they continued to thrive. Now, one of the things that may have happened um, is, uh, I think, an archaeologist at Hunter College in New York who proposed this. Um, he proposed that, you know, maybe what actually happened was there was something in the Norse culture that did not allow them, at least locally, that did not allow them to interact with the Inuit in positive ways, which meant they couldn't uh, talk about ways to survive. They couldn't talk about technologies and things like that. So maybe what happened was the Norse were adapted to that climate when they got to Greenland. The climate changed. Suddenly, they didn't change, and they were maladapted to this new environment. And so they died off. And so this brings up the question, how will we adapt? If we have this climate change that is going on right now, and I suppose we can hope that it's not permanent, but we don't know. Um, but the, the question becomes, how will we adapt to warming temperatures, whether in Vermont or anywhere? You know, what's going to happen to our maple industry? What's going to happen to the ski industry? Things like that. Will we be able to adapt to those things? But also, can we adapt to our changing climate to maybe stop it from changing so much? After all, if we don't, Miami's going to be underwater very soon. Boston, not too far after that. So that's kind of where it ends. So that, this is where, obviously, natural resources come in. Um, 
you know, do we want to continue to use carbon-based fossil fuels or should we start to adapt by moving into renewable resources? And that's what I have. So thank you. Um, I, I don't mean to be flip with this question, but would you call the, the people of New Orleans a group that was maladapted? Um, I mean, the, the, the population has reduced dramatically. It's, right. diff it's a different population that is there today than 10 years prior. Okay, the, um, people of New Orleans being maladapted, I, I would say that they've maybe, that's not the best place to have a settlement, given that with rising sea levels, New Orleans is already a little bit below that. Um, uh, if, if we continue on that course, how about as a culture, American society would be maladapted to that particular situation. Um, I think it is within our culture to move the city if we really wanted to and if we had the resources to devote to it. But yeah, I mean, New Orleans is in trouble long term. I don't know if that answers it. <laughs> Wouldn't that beg the question of what you're doing? Yeah, and, and actually, it's a, a, it's a group that has adapted and absolutely is still being adaptable. Yeah, so and maybe it is something more specific to New Orleans, and, but not specific to the fact that they're both below water. Yeah, it could be as simple as we need to talk to people in the Netherlands and maybe <coughs> see how we can adapt their technology to our situations not just in New Orleans at this point, but also in some of the other East Coast cities that are going to be flooded out. So I guess that gets into the question, do we have it within our culture to talk to other cultures? I, I'd like to think yes, but I, I know that's probably a contentious issue. Why was California, which is not adapted to large populations, how come so many people moved out there? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a situation of altering the environment to make it seem like it could support a lot more people than it can. <laughs> uh, it's really a, com a combination of um, we have very limited water resources in Southern California, so we created, actually I, I would say we created the illusion of having water resources available for everyone with, um, you know, Hetch Hetchy project or you know, a number of, of other um, water diversion and storage projects. Then you have um, the Beach Boys, California girls that actually, I know one person who actually went to college in California in the 60s because he heard that song. <laughs> so there was that image that was also sold, um, especially around the time of, of the baby boom. Um, but a lot of it has to do with, with um, environmental engineering. And really, the California environment, as we're seeing right now, probably can't support the number of people that it's supporting. It's not only supporting people in California. It's supporting people all across the United States with those farms throughout California. The other really serious issue is uh, Texas, Western Kansas, Colorado, Nebraska, and places like that where you have uh, very limited water resources in that region too, which are quickly drying up. And that's a pretty productive part of the country as well. So what's going to happen in the United States when those parts of the country aren't as productive in terms of food production as they once were? And I don't pretend to have those answers. But it's something that, as a society, we need to think about. So the, the, the New Orleans um, culture was some people decided to stay after, um, I forget which one, I met somebody here. Katrina. 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 Sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to be flip either. But <laughs> a whole bunch of them decided to stay. Uh, but there was serious discussion, of, uh, even at the national level, about bailing out, right? Yep. Leaving. 
you spent time in Grand Forks, that's put underwater a bunch. Yeah. But there was never any discussion of relocating Grand Forks. Well, actually, there was. There was. Um, yeah, after the but flooding in the mid 1990s, um, they actually did abandon part of Grand Forks and they moved a good deal of the population west. They bought out a bunch of stuff, it's homes by the river, right? Yeah. And stuff, but, they, but in terms of all the commercial and the heart of it, it was there, there was a serious, serious thinking whether they could carry out or not. There was serious thinking about relocating Grand Forks? There, there actually was, my understanding. I had already moved out of Grand Forks when that happened, but right. my understanding <laughs> is that there was. Um, but they ended up instead doing some engineering work. And so they have these massive, um, I don't know what they'd be called actually, but these massive structures that are supposed to close when there's a, a flood and keep the water from taking over Grand Forks. I only saw that about 10 years ago for the first time. That was really kind of eye-opening because it wasn't the same city I had seen back in the early 1990s. I just want to say, as, as good as we are in this country, um, uh, one of our biggest obstacles is our arrogance. I spend three or four months a year in Europe, and I have a lot of friends over there. I've been working all alter alternative energy, as Steve can tell you, um, in the geothermal and uh, enhanced hydro applications. Um, and I have to compliment um, Green Mountain Power for doing their part with the, uh, the solar because of the uh, environmental changes. It supports it, but there's other all energies also. You know, we don't have all the answers. And here we are, a nation of 200 years, telling other nations 2,000 years how to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. When we should be learning, keeping our mouth shut and listening more and incorporating some of these things that do work. And it's proven technology. You guys were talking about Holland and New Orleans and so forth. Um, Holland is a pioneer in uh, water control, okay? And, um, there's a lot to be learned from that, and there's a lot to be learned in alternative energy, um, not just the, the solar side of it, but the others that are less invasive on the environment, okay, more sustainable, okay, and and um, and more predictable. But again, we get people in positions of authority, okay, and we put them there. Mm -hmm. we, we only have ourselves to blame, right? <laughs> we don't hold anybody accountable, and we question nothing, and then we stand back and bitch about why things are happening the way they are. Yeah, so, I, I would say we question the wrong things. We what? We question the wrong things sometimes. Well, the priorities are all screwed up. Yeah. yeah. But again, it comes down to there is so much more we could be doing to help ourselves if we chose to. Mm -hmm. If we don't speak up, then we get what we get. So um, just trying to be the voice of reason and bring things to um, the front. And that's why when we bring this out here, how will we adapt? Until we get the right people in positions of authority, we won't do a very good job of adapting. We could be so much better than we really are. Now, I almost opened, and I thought better of it at the time, because um, I tend not to be too political when I teach. But you know, looking at energy policy in the early 2000s, and how our energy policy in the United States was very much based on the idea that um, in the future, the United States is going to continue to consume as much as we consume, which is about one, a little over a fifth of the world's resources for a population of about 320 million people. China, which has four times our population, uh, has a stated goal of by 2025, I think, maybe it's 2030, um, raising their population to the same consumption levels as the United States. Um, and India also exists. I mean, we're only 320 million people in a world of 7.2 billion. And so if everybody wants to, to live at this level, something's going to have to give. Um, so I almost opened up with the, the idea of our, our uh, energy policy being, you know, if the United States wants to maintain its position as a leading country in the world, we need to secure fossil fuel resources, which was the policy of um, the Bush administration uh, from 2000 to 2001 to 2009. Um, and if you look at the world through, through that lens and you <coughs> do things like um, get into um, alternative forms of energy, then you're 
going to get into wars. And, you know, while I, I do agree that there is going to be this competition, there already is this competition for fuel resources around the world, uh, I'm not so sure. In fact, I will say that I know that um, we are wrong. <laughs> I don't get to say that very much in my classes. I get my students to say things. Um, but, but we are actually wrong if we're going to continue to, um, to demand that we have access to fossil fuel resources without any kind of, um, you know, without improving our, or increasing our reliance on um, renewables. I'll be the student then and just say, you're right on, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you get an A. Thank you. Question back to the Norse uh, in, in Greenland. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know this, but did they leave Newfoundland about the same time where they had that settlement in northern Newfoundland? And um, for whatever, it's not too far latitude difference than Greenland, the you know, ice cap, I guess. And, and likewise, the Norse settled extensively in Iceland where they kind of succeeded. Stagger one that they succeeded, and in Scotland they settled in and intermarried with the Scots, and mm -hmm. still have significant influence in most of Northern Scotland. So, in some cultures they could, in some situations they did successfully adapt. But yeah. In others, they died out. So does that mean it was more of an environmental thing and less of a cultural thing? Well, it could be. Uh, with, in the case of the uh, Western Settlement in Greenland, the theory by, I wish I could remember his name, but he is an anthropologist at Hunter College. Uh, his theory is that in the case of the Western Settlement, the church actually came to own so much land and became so powerful that they, you know, as a cultural entity, could dictate whether or not their, the, their followers interacted at all with the Inuit. And so they actually formed a barrier to that uh, interaction. So that it may yet be cultural in that case. Now, in the case of um, Newfoundland, I'm not as familiar with that, but um, I know that one didn't last very long. I think that only lasted a couple of years, if I remember right. It was probably less than a century for what I was Yeah. Less than a century. And I know part of the problem was that they didn't get along with the native peoples there. So there, you know, that, that, there was friction. Beyond that, I, I honestly don't know much about them. Though. Got coming full circle. You talked about geography at speaking back to the other disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, I looked at your map there, where you have the different climates in the United States, and I'm thinking that the green section um, is also a section where they don't talk about climate change. Um, in fact, there's a lot of climate change deniers. What you have said here today was, it didn't meet with any controversy in the room that I could see. Um, when I was at the University of Georgia, it would have. Yep. How do you, what can geography offer back to sociology and political science to help explain that? Help to explain why? The fact that the states that are going to be most first affected by Climate change are the, the, the least to recognize it. Mm, um, that's a good question. Um, it, it's a really good question because I've been kind of baffled by that myself. Um, having taught in Texas, a, a very conservative part of a very conservative state, um, I can tell you that People, even 10 years ago, were beginning to understand that maybe we do have an impact on the environment, even if they don't want to listen to um, what politicians say. And actually, one thing that I try to stress, because it, it really goes beyond just climate change, it, it gets into science in general. Uh, so one thing I try to stress is that I don't care what the politicians say. I don't care what the people on the radio say. Um, I care about what the experts who study these things say. And I, I know I'm not going to answer your question in, in saying this, but um, you know, the, the experts, the 97% of all climate scientists, many of whom were, were geographers, by the way, 
Uh, the 97% of the climate scientists in the world agree that there is global climate change and that we are causing it. And it's sort of like, you know, if, if would you go to your radio personality and ask if, you know, this lesion on your hand is cancer? Or would you ask your politician if that lesion might be cancer? Or would you go to a doctor, somebody who's actually an expert in that area? Um, so that's my position on it. As far as what we can, can do, I don't know. It's a little bit outside my, my range of expertise, I'm afraid. <laughs> Anything else? Well, I have one question. There, there's, there seems to be a general um, understanding that we could, we could do something economically to show the cost better of some of our choices. Um, but everything that's been said here kind of, uh, you know, you, you, it's hard to, to determine the cost of global warming if you don't really believe it's going to happen or you don't that's know how true. fast it's going to happen or you don't. But I was just curious if you have any sense of where that initiative of trying to define cost and build it into our economic structures, where, where that's headed or if it's got any... Well, I know that the, uh, the Pentagon and the CIA have begun looking into those things. Because uh, at those levels, they understand that uh, climate change is a national security issue. Um, so they have begun to look at the cost of climate change in terms of national security. Now, as far as more generally, I'm sure that there are organizations and individuals working on that. I can't tell you what specifically at the moment, though, because it's, again, a little outside of my expertise. There are economic geographers, by the way. <laughs> Like, like I said, geographers get into ed everything. Economic geographers are the ones who make all the money, <laughs> not the cultural geographers. As a, as a geography studying human behavior, what, what's your guess about as the drought continues in California and Texas and Arizona, which used to be the places where everyone was supposed to go in the winter because it was warm? What's your guess as to will you, well, are you think you're going to see a movement of people moving away from those areas and moving where they're, where there's in more temperate climates, where there is water, where they, they're not so dependent on electricity for air conditioning, et cetera? Do you, do you think that's going to happen? Uh, it's a really good question. I don't know, but I would imagine that if the water restrictions we're seeing in California that, that are going into effect are there for a long period of time, we probably will see an exodus like we did with the Great Plains in the Dust Bowl years. Um, at the moment, in the case of California, the, the water restrictions don't extend to certain corporations that use a lot of water. Um, so I don't know how quickly that will happen, but I, 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 would, I would think that if this, is, if this goes on for a number of years beyond this, that we are going to start seeing people leave. And it, it wouldn't be unprecedented, even in American history. Maybe urban to rural or urban to <coughs> other urban is a little bit, but as far as mass migration, probably not. Didn't California develop during one of those wet periods that was kind of an illusion of something that's not the real, real reality? I, there may have been. I know that that was the case in parts of the Great Plains, but I'm honestly not sure. About that. Early California history is a little bit before me, I'm afraid. I consider myself a geographer of the United States, but I tend to concentrate on New England and the Great Plains, which is why I brought up the Oglala Aquifer and Kansas and Nebraska. Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.